Okay, welcome. I'm Scott Greer from University, and you're not here to listen to me, so I'll be quick. First of all, mobile phones off, please. This is being recorded for podcasting and a live web stream, so you don't want to provide extra musical entertainment. And I am delighted to be able to introduce our two speakers today, whom we're very lucky to have. The first to speak will be Ambassador Peter Taksu of Denmark, who has been a Danish diplomat since 1986, serving in a variety of capacities, ranging from the Danish embassy in Vienna to a very long career, including being head of the legal service in the Danish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And after a spell as the Assistant Secretary General for Legal Affairs of the United Nations, he's now Danish ambassador to the United States representing the country that is currently holding the rotating presidency of the European Union. The other person I'd like to introduce is Ambassador Joao Valdemera, who is the head of the delegation of the European Union to the United States. He's been in that capacity since August 2010. Prior to his appointment in Washington, he was Director General for External Relations at the European Commission and is the most senior official under the authority of the High Representative and Vice President, Baroness Ashton, he helped formulate and execute the EU's foreign policy and played a key role in preparing for the new European External Action Service introduced by the Treaty of Lisbon. Before that, he served in a couple of pretty interesting jobs, such as Head of Cabinet for Commission President José Manuel Barroso and his Sherpa for negotiations at the G8, G20, and personal representative for negotiations in the Treaty of Lisbon. These capped some of the things he did after joining the European Commission in 1982. Ambassador Taxa will speak first. Ambassador Valdemera will speak second. Then there will be a question and answer. Given that we're on a tight schedule, I will pop up again and uh, take questions in groups of three so that we can end at 1 o'clock at, at noon sharp. Thanks very much, and I'll sit down now. Thank you um, very much for, for that in introduction, and, and thank you very much uh, for this occasion to come out here and speak to all of you today. For me, it's a great pleasure to be here and to meet the committed faculty. We already had a chance to talk to some of them this morning, and students uh, of the University of Michigan. I'm glad to see such a big turnout. We never thought we were going to compete with the guy you have in here tomorrow. But still, having so many people here is really uh, a great pleasure. I wanted to come and, and, and focus in my uh, introductory remarks uh, on the Danish presidency. As uh, many of you might know, Denmark took over the presidency of the European Union uh, at, on the 1st of January for a six, period of six months. So I'll talk a little bit about our priorities there, but also maybe focus a little bit on uh, our green agenda, which is part also of our presidency um, priorities. Denmark's uh, 2012 EU presidency coincides with the 40th anniversary of Denmark's decision to join uh, the European Union. So we have been part of this project for 40 years. Um, and it has been uh, an interesting time to be part of the United uh, Europe. When we joined, uh, Europe moved from being nine to 12 member states. And since then, a lot of things has happened, both in terms of uh, the areas of cooperation we have in Europe, but also in terms of enlargements uh, that has gone forward uh, since we joined. The last Danish presidency, I think we have had seven presidencies, but the last Danish presidency was in 2002. At that time, uh, our challenge was different from the one we have today. We had one, we had a single issue presidency at the time. Our task was to see if we could get agreement to uh, make the biggest leap in enlargement uh, that ever happened in the European Union, and we were very proud to actually manage that process, and uh, at the end of the, uh, at the Danish presidency in 2002, 10 new members of Eastern Europe was uh, included in uh, the European Union. This time is very different for two reasons. Firstly, because there's not this big issue that we have to, to handle. We have 
many smaller issues, you could say, that we have to move forward on the agenda, but there's not one thing that we need to accomplish at the end of the six months where we have the presidency. So we are focusing on different areas, and I'll get back to what these areas are. But the second reason why it's very different uh, from the earlier presidencies is because of the new treaties that we have in place since our last presidency, the Lisbon Treaty, which means that a lot of uh, the what used to be the obligations of the presidency has non, now be, been transformed from na the national presidency to the European uh, Council, uh, the institution. We have a new president of the Commission, Barroso, who has a stronger role. We have a president of the European Council, Van Rompuy, who is leading uh, the European Council meetings. We have an EU foreign minister. I, don't know, I know we don't call it that normally, but a uh, high representative for international affairs, I think we call it, uh, Lady Ashton. We have uh, a new EU foreign service uh, since the last time we had our presidency. I have my colleague, uh, the EU ambassador to the US, uh, who is representing the European Union in the United States. My colleague in 2002 in the Danish embassy was the one who was representing the, unit, the union in the U.S. Now, this is not my task. This is the task of, of my colleague. Uh, and me. So there's many things that are very different from what they used to be uh, uh, before the Lisbon Treaty. I think the last thing that should be mentioned, uh, which is, I think, important, is also sort of how the balance of the institutions of the European Union has been developed over the time where we have been members. The one thing that is uh, certain is that the European Parliament has, uh, has become much, a much more significant institution than it was when we started off. At the time, it was the Commission and the Council. Now the European Parliament uh, plays an, a very central role in, uh, in the legislative process of the European Union. Uh, so that is also something that we have to take into account. A key task of the Danish presidency will be, and we couldn't plan for this, but, but this is on our table, is to, to do what we can to, to, to get the right policies and, and uh, tools in place to cope with the economic crisis that we are faced with in Europe. Many critics say that uh, when it first sort of went from the US to Europe, uh, the crisis in, in sort of the policy approach to the crisis in Europe was sort of able too little too late uh, in the beginning and maybe some of the critics uh, were a little bit right in the beginning but I think if you look at what has been done over the last six months uh, the European leaders have really stepped up to the plate and has come forward with in my view and also in the view of, of our colleagues back home the necessary uh, policy decisions to cope with this uh, crisis that we are faced with. The two European councils we had last autumn were uh, instrumental in putting in place the right tools to be able to, to, to handle the crisis. It's so not over yet, but I think there was a, a, a change in the trajectory in the way that now we are in a more positive uh, mode and, and the task is more now to implement the decisions that we already took and then, of course, uh, continue to explain to nervous markets that we have the right policies in place and it always takes time when you have 27 democracies who, are, who has to back these uh, decisions up but we are moving forward not backward in Europe for Denmark the slogan <coughs> excuse me, for the Danish EU presidency is Europe at work we need to roll up our sleeves and work for key European reforms that can help complement what member states are doing at the national level to stimulate growth, create jobs, promote innovation and increase uh, the international competitiveness of European member states and Europe as a region. And we have defined four priority areas for the Danish presidency. Firstly, a responsible Europe. Secondly, a dynamic Europe. Thirdly, a safe Europe. And finally, a green Europe. By responsible Europe, we mean that we will focus on making Europe more economically responsible. We want to include new rules on economic governance. This is already being moved forward and help be the bridge builder between 
the 17 euro member states and the 10 who is not part of the euro so that we ensure that uh, we have a strong united Europe coming out of this crisis. We also need to put forward the budget negotiations on the European budget. Uh, the one we are in now, the budget circle ends at the end of 2013, so new, a new budget will be in place and here our challenge is to to get the right balance so the resources that member states are sending to Brussels are used to further the agenda of creating jobs and growth in Europe. One other tool in creating or helping to have a more dynamic Europe is to look again at the single market that were created 20 years or more than 20 years ago. In, I think it ended in 1986. This is a very, very significant economic tool that has helped create growth in Europe uh, over the years. But we believe that if you look again at uh, the internal market, the single market that we have in Europe, there are still improved the improvements that can be made so that we can uh, foster even more trade without any barriers between European states. My own country, Denmark, is a small open economy with six million, five million people. Our most important markets are Germany and Sweden and the UK inside the European Union. So if we can just sort of do something to level the play, playing ground even more, that will have a very positive impact also for Danish business and for Danish citizens. We also want to work for a safer Europe. I think the Arab Spring taught us that uh, even though we have uh, the Sikh Schengen cooperation, there still need to do more in order to uh, be able to, uh, to cope with these new challenges that we see on European shores. Uh, so work uh, has to be done there. And on the other, on the sort of more external side of it, we uh, are committed to supporting uh, the EU action service in uh, helping uh, to promote our ambition in Europe to, for Europe to play a global role and uh, take part in global issues, not only in climate change, but also in policy issues and so forth. We want to have a look at uh, trade policy. We also want to look at enlargement. Uh, this has been a great tool for Europe, one of the best tools in promoting the values uh, that we have in Europe. Uh, the Europe that used to be has been expanded a lot, and this has helped us create a Europe almost whole and free. But there are still new steps that need to be taken. We haven't sort of finalized our job. There's still enlargement processes that has to go forward, for instance, in the Balkans and to our east, and we want to promote that. As uh, you mentioned this morning, Croatia had a referendum and said yes to uh, their accession and hopefully they will be the 28th member state by 2013. But that's not the end of the road. We also need to include Montenegro, Serbia, Kosovo uh, and so forth. Uh, so there's more work to be done there. And finally, and I'll say a little more about that, we also want to have a green Europe. Um, we will promote a green Europe uh, by further greening the European economies and green growth. What we're doing here uh, as a Danish presidency is to try to work for an energy and, clim energy and climate roadmaps for coming decades leading towards 2050 with improved energy efficiency and increased use of renewable energy in Europe. I think we, in Europe we realize we will not be able to save the world but we can lead by example and we are already doing that but we want to continue down the road of what we in Denmark call the Green Revolution, the revolution that will lead to a situation by, whereby uh, post-industrial societies like the Danish will be able to go forward with economic growth uh, without any use of fossil fuels. This is our ambition for 2050. We want to establish a single market for energy uh, so that uh, through expansion of the European energy infrastructure, we can create growth in that sector as well. We think it's necessary to have a strong European 
voiced at the UN Rio Plus 20 conference where sustainable development is uh, the headline. Uh, Europe has a lot to offer here, so we will work on that. Uh, and then uh, sort of mainstreaming uh, energy, climate and environment considerations into all the other policy areas in the European Union where it makes sense is also something that we're working on, agriculture, fishing and so forth. We think that green transition is important for our climate now, but also imperative for our economic growth in the future. We need good, well-paid, knowledge-intensive jobs, and green jobs can be part of that. Uh, so therefore, we believe in Europe that if we invest smartly, uh, we can uh, have better growth and also come to a situation where we have a more sustainable, reliable and an affordable energy system than we have now. And Denmark is, we think, uh, quite well suited to lead in this area. Uh, we have decades of experience in the business of saving energy and transition to new energy, going back to the first oil crisis in the 70s. Over the years, we have worked hard uh, on different areas. For instance, we have been able to, over the last 30 years, to keep our energy consumption flat uh, and have economic growth of, I think, 76% in the same period. We have managed to uh, go to, uh, through a situation where we have, we were, I think, 90% dependent on foreign, foreign oil, and now we are 100% independent. We have focused a lot of, uh, on renewables, especially wind. Uh, we are one of the leaders on tech, uh, green tech in that area. 28% of our energy consumption now comes from uh, renewable energy. Uh, our ambition is that, apart from transportation, all energy will come from renewables in 2035. And uh, in 2050, as I said, we are, paying, we are putting together the policies necessary to be totally fossil free. This also has a positive effect on, on uh, creating jobs in, in Denmark. Uh, we have uh, now 13% uh, of our exports are clean tech uh, exports, so it, it has a big impact on, on uh, Danish uh, exports as well that we uh, have been able to go forward on these, in these areas. We think that this is a great investment. In the beginning, it will cost the consumers a little bit, but this will mean that the investment we make now will mean that it will not become extremely expensive for consumers to buy energy 10 or 20 years down the road. So the investment, investing in these areas is going to be a little bit more costly in the short term, but will be a huge investment that will have a lot of benefits in the longer term. There's one issue where we also want to go forward, and that is the transatlantic uh, cooperation. Uh, we are very happy with the fact that at the last EU-US summit, there was a decision to uh, establish a working group. It sounds like something put into a, something, <coughs> something that will never happen, but we believe that this is really good, that the EU and the US is focusing in this working group on job creation and growth. Uh, if you look at the uh, economies on both sides of the Atlantic, we are, are we 500 million or 350 million in, the, in, 500 million in Europe. The European economy uh, is huge, and this goes for the American economy as well. The trade between the two uh, regions are the, the largest trade in the world. So if we can just do a little bit to level the playing field in the transatlantic area as well, it will have a huge impact on the economies on both sides of the Atlantic. So I hope this working group, and uh, we're pushing from our presidency to, to push this forward, that this working group will come up with new ideas, maybe a new free trade uh, agreement, maybe not, maybe better focus on what can be achieved in the short run, but at least focus on on areas where uh, the two richest areas in the world improve their relations even further, and we'll do that as well. Thank you so much for your attention. I'll give the floor to my European colleague. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, I hope you can hear me. Is that the case? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, and thank you, Denmark, for being such an inspiring country. Uh, for Europe, uh, uh, from the environmental area to the social area and to the education field and uh, uh, in economic terms, it's, it's, uh, it's a model country for, for, uh, for Europe, I dare to say, uh, uh, here, and we count a lot on, on their enthusiasm and their commitment for the next uh, six months. Um, last year, I'm sure you've all read and heard uh, news about Europe which was not uh, particularly uh, inspiring uh, and not necessarily always positive. Uh, so I'd like to, in my very brief remarks, because I will, I'd like to leave enough time for questions and answers, I will refer to uh, what I believe are three important good news in the, in, in the very beginning of this new year 2012. And the first one is Croatia. Croatia is a very small country in the, in the Western Balkans. Uh, I see a few smiles. Maybe there are some uh, Croat origin people in the, in the room. Uh, small country, but a very important country, of course, coming from a region which was uh, a victim of uh, years and years of uh, extremely difficult uh, situation. Well, the Croat people decided uh, overwhelmingly in favor of joining the European Union last uh, Sunday. And this is for us very good news, that in spite of the problems, in spite of the difficulties of the euro area, sovereign debt crisis and everything associated with it, and also the debate that is going on in Europe about solutions for this crisis and for the future of the Union, uh, the Croat people decided again overwhelmingly, beyond the 66%, to, to join, uh, to confirm uh, accession to the European Union. So, if everything goes well with our own ratification, they will be uh, the 28th member of the European Union by July of next year. And this is very good news because it means that uh, people still want to join the Union. So, uh, we, I'm sure we're not all that bad if people are still wanting to join. As, as Peter said, there are many more beyond the Croats wanting to join the European Union from Iceland to Turkey to the, the whole uh, uh, Balkan uh, region. So this is good news to, uh, to start the year. The second good news is what we adopted this uh, past Monday in Brussels regarding Iran. And uh, what we did basically is first to confirm our dual track approach. Uh, as far as Iran is concerned, uh, we want to uh, guarantee that they don't develop the capacity to have a nuclear weapon, that their nuclear program is entirely dedicated and focused on civilian use of nuclear and not military use, for reasons that I believe you understand uh, perfectly. And in doing so, we pursue a two-track approach. We are ready to discuss uh, openly with our Iranian friends without any preconditions from their side, and we have renovated again and again our invitation for talks. So far, the last invitation has received no reply, official reply yet from the Iranians. The second track is one of uh, measures taken uh, to uh, make very clear the case that we will not accept the military capacity, nuclear capacity in Iran, and we are ready to take whatever action is necessary. And we adopted a robust set of measures largely known as sanctions against Iran. And in doing so, we overcame, of course, different views inside the European Union. Not all the countries are so much in favor of sanctions. Not all the countries are uh, necessarily on the same ground in terms of what to do. But we were able to find a common ground at the very high level of ambition to, to deal with this case, which we believe is a threat to the security of Europe. And in doing so, we were very much aligned with the position of the United States and uh, for me it's good news that Europe not only is able to produce a robust set of measures uh, dealing with a very difficult situation but that we do it at the same time in, in very good synchrony with uh, the United States. And the third good news is that in the first weeks of January uh, stock markets have largely go, gone up and sovereign debt spreads have largely gone down. Uh, and I see this as a, as a sign that we are on the right track in 
addressing the issues affecting uh, the euro area in, and the European Union in general uh, from the point of view of the economic and financial situation. So three pieces of good news that at the same time, in my view, are very symbolic about what the EU means, what it can do, and the track on which it is to uh, solve its own problem. A very last comment on EU and the US, prolonging what Peter just said. Uh, you know, we are all attentively looking at Asia, Pacific, China. I do not wish us to forget that for the moment, the most important economic bilateral relationship in the world is the one that happens across the Atlantic. If you take Canada, United States and European Union, you have by far, by far, the most important economic bloc in the world. If you take the EU and the US, 800 million people, more than 50% of world's GDP, more than 40% of world's trade, and this will remain still for some time, even in spite of the development of Asia. But even more than that, and of course there is a potential we are not using, and Peter is absolutely right, we need to go all the way to use the potential of the transatlantic economic relationship to produce more jobs and more growth. But beyond that, uh, there are the issue of our common values that we share about democracy, human rights, rule of law, individual freedom. Uh, I don't see that many uh, blocks in the world, or for that matter, big countries that have so much in common with the US as we in Europe do. And I think uh, if we look at the challenges around this world, where not only economic challenges, but also political challenges, there are regimes and systems in this world which do not share fully our values and that can become attractive to other areas of the world, I think it's our responsibility not only to develop the economic dimension of this bilateral relationship, but to look at the, at the values that bring us together, to promote those values in, universally, so that our vision of the world, our vision of how the society should be organized, that along the values I referred to, is the one that, uh, at the end of the day, uh, shapes uh, the world governance, shapes the world the way the world evolves, including on environmental matters, including on the sustainability of our, of our policy. So uh, I would like to leave this remark on the importance, the relevance uh, uh, of the transatlantic relationship, and I'm sure throughout the next uh, six months we'll be able to reinforce that even further. Thank you. Microphone. So I'd like to take questions in three, and I'd like you to introduce yourself, especially if you're a student, um, introduce yourself generously so we, the ambassadors can see who is turned out from the University of Michigan. And while you prepare your thoughts, I thought I could take the privilege of the guy behind the podium and begin with one question. You mentioned Denmark's presidency being a potential bridge builder between the Eurozone and the non-Eurozone countries. And I was wondering if you could speak a bit more to that. We hear so much about the policies of the Eurozone. Are there shared interests between the non-Eurozone countries? Is there scope for shared institutional architecture um, between Eurozone and non-Eurozone countries? Does it put any, create any challenges for EU institutions? Anybody wants to jump in now? Or? You, please. Well, um, I'm a PhD student from the uh, Slavic department. My name is Alexander Boschkovic. And I have a specific question regarding enlargement of EU. Um, as you mentioned, Croatia became uh, a candidate. And in a year or so, uh, I hope uh, Croatia will become a 28th member. But my question is, um, uh, is there any chance for um, other uh, countries, so Western Balkans, specifically Serbia, uh, to achieve candidacy uh, in this period while Denmark is, uh, has a presidential role? Thank you. In the back, please. I recently finished reading a book on the Third Industrial Revolution, um, and I think the author's name was Jeremy Rifkin. 
and he claims that he's very involved in consultation with the European, the EU leadership regarding adopting the principles of that third industrial revolution, which involves distributed energy and the construction of a smart grid infrastructure. I'm interested in knowing if these claims are true and if really the EU is moving in that direction. I'll hold the other question I saw for a moment if you'd like to. Can you hear me as a speaker? Yeah. Can I go first and then I'll leave all the Brussels stuff to you, my friend. No, first on, and I think that is a very pertinent question. We saw at the last European Council meeting, those of you who have followed that, that unfortunately we came out and 26 countries agreed and one country couldn't sign up to the agreement. We have a situation and we have had for a long time a situation where we have different areas of cooperation inside the European Union. Denmark, for one, are not participating and decided not to participate in the economic and monetary union, meaning that we do not have the euro. So there are 17 countries who participate in the euro. But if we look at what is on the table in Brussels now to come back to your question, the ambition is that all 27, hopefully 26 at least, will sign up to the new treaty that is being negotiated. There will then be in the treaty, for logical reasons, different obligations for different categories of member states. If you are a Eurozone member state, you have more, can we say, intrusive obligations vis-a-vis your financial policy because what you do at the national level have a direct impact at the euro level. That's not the case for my country in the same extent, but we are going to sign up to the same treaty. We also want to have a healthy financial system in Denmark. So therefore it makes a lot of good sense for us to be part of this. And we, as the presidency now, since we are not part of the 17, consider ourselves, as I said, the bridge builders. We are going, my prime minister is moving around Europe to rally consensus to get all European countries behind the solutions that are necessary. And we believe that is going to happen. I think if you look at every time you have change, you also have danger, and you have to just address the danger and push it forward. In another setting, Xiao said, and I believe that is really true, that the European Union lives from crisis, and we actually come out stronger every time we have a crisis. Now we have one, you won, and at the end of this, and it will take time to get through it, we will have a stronger Europe than we had beforehand. I think it is a little bit a bridge too far to achieve a candidacy for Serbia over the next six months. But I know that new chapters are being opened and that the process of getting Serbia closer to accession of the European Union is being moved forward. We hope to take the next steps, but it will take a little longer before the whole reform process and negotiations with the Commission on different chapters and so forth can start and will be finished. So we don't have an ambition to have Serbia part of the European Union by mid-2012. But the track is there, and we want to ensure that it continues to be there because we believe that the values that this will export to Serbia and other places will also bring Serbia to go through the right reforms to handle their internal issues as well. One issue we are not talking about is the whole issue of Kosovo, which is, can you say, a frozen crisis. And I believe that crisis will only be solved once Serbia and Kosovo become members of the European Union. So that's a long-term solution, but it will take a little time to get there. We are working on improving the grid, energy grid in Europe. This is part of it. Whether it's Mr. Rifkin who went to the Commission and inspired that, I don't know. But I know that these issues are issues on the table. And so it makes a lot of sense to 
as I said in the, in the first speech, to, to improve uh, and bring Europe even closer together uh, uh, at, on the energy side with a common energy market and uh, building a smart grid, uh, not only for part of Europe, but for, for the whole of Europe. Uh, a lot of money uh, can be made out of that, so we're working on that, but where the inspiration comes, I don't know whether he had an impact. Shao, do you want to address that? Or well, uh, um, I don't know about Mr. This, is this working? working? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, I don't know exactly about Mr. Rifkin. I know I've read some of his books and uh, he's, very, he's very much a pro-European author and we welcome that and uh, <coughs> he believes that uh, there is a European dream being materialized and, and, and I share his view. If I, look back at the, if I look back at the history of the Union and the history of wars, uh, you know, the last 60 years were the longest period of peace in, in the European continent that we have memory of. Uh, and this is, and 60 years is not long in uh, history, of course, but still, it's better than nothing. And uh, it's largely the result of uh, European integration efforts and the European Union that we have today. Um, on the second, uh, uh, on the issue of greed and, uh, and, 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 and all that, I mean, I don't have much to add to what Peter said. Uh, but there's a good example in, in the transatlantic relationship, which has to do with uh, electric cars and what we call e-mobility. Uh, we know there is a market out there for electric cars. It's already happening even in the United States. Um, we know that there will be millions of electric cars in the world in a few years' time. Uh, the question is, who is going to set the rules of that market? Who is going to decide the, the size of the battery, the, 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 the format of the plug? Uh, and who is going to sort of set the rules for the link between the grids, which has to be a smart grid, and the, our capacity to, to have these uh, millions of electric cars on the road. And the question that we are debating with the, our American friends, and we are very much advanced there with the industry as well, is we want to make sure that it is us, Americans, Europeans, that call the shots. Uh, the technology is on our side. Uh, why not go an extra step and say uh, the setting of the rules uh, uh, and the formatting of the future market is also on our side. That will give us uh, an, an enormous advantage for the future. Or do we want to leave it to other people, to other countries that have uh, more important markets, that have the critical mass of, uh, of the future market to determine the way we would organize this market. It's, it's, it's an interesting, very important politically and economically uh, illustration of what the EU and the US can do together if we join efforts uh, and uh, if we share the goals. And I believe we do share the goals that we need to develop uh, new sources of energy, that we need to become uh, less dependent from the outside in terms of our energy supply, and that we need to look at the, at the planet. And the issue of climate change, uh, to which we are Europeans uh, extremely committed to, there is a debate in this country, or maybe not so much in some areas, but I think there should be a debate in this country about climate change. We are talking to the Americans about this. Uh, there is an international process and negotiation going on. We remain very committed, and we believe that if the EU and the US join efforts for this kind of world challenges, we can achieve uh, quite a lot. On Serbia and the enlargement, uh, let's be uh, clear. Um, you know, we started with six countries, largely around France and Germany. We are now 27, soon 28, with Croatia. 500 million people today. Uh, continental dimension, we go from the Atlantic shores in my hometown, uh, Lisbon, to the, to the Russian border in Lithuania or Estonia or Finland. Uh, if Iceland joins, and we are very advanced in the process of uh, negotiations with Iceland, we will, there will be a European Union from the Arctic Circle to uh, almost uh, 300 miles from the shores of Libya or the shores of Lebanon in Cyprus and Malta. So this is the kind of Europe we're talking about today. And all these people sharing common values, all our democracies, all protect and promote human rights, all protect and promote individual freedom, and they have a standard, we have standards of living 
that are among the highest in the world, not to mention the quality of life, not to mention the quality of the environment, of education, social systems, and all that. Some in this country may not like it, and some are even saying so. Uh, that's absolutely fine with me. Uh, we happen to like Europe, <coughs> and we happen to be proud of Europe. And, and I think we'll remain being proud of Europe. Uh, but mostly what we would like to see is, of course, sharing this quality of life, this prosperity, in spite of the difficulties, and I'm not complacent about the present difficulties, with a maximum number of Europeans. That's the process that we started, uh, you know, a long time ago, uh, that we are now moving towards Croatia. We hope other Baltic countries, uh, Balkan countries will join including uh, Serbia. Uh, Serbia has to fulfill a few conditions that are not yet fully met. They mainly have to do with the situation or the relationship with, with Kosovo, but we are very close to be able to move a step forward in terms of uh, uh, Serbia's uh, candidacy to, to the European Union. On, uh, I think I completed what uh, Peter has said on these uh, three questions. There was a hand over here in the last round. Uh, hi, I'm a freshman student here at the University of Michigan. Um, I'm wondering if there's any change in the possible bins of Turkey into the European Union. Any recent change, I should say. And you in the second row? Yeah. Uh, when well, so you mentioned the uh, UN Atlas as a promoter of democracy and so on, and after that, but well, economic setbacks were kind of uh, uh, foreseeable, but perhaps not the political ones. What do you think about the EU's response to Hungarian, uh, to the Hungarian constitution and so on? Is it too little and especially is it too late? Answer in gray in the back. My question was also about Hungary. Okay, perfect. Um, Lauren Todd from the Urban Institute here uh, in Michigan. Um, I have a question about uh, corporations um, dealing with the EU ETS and how do you currently see corporations dealing with it and foresee, especially considering that other corporations around the world that they're competing with, um, their governments are not uh, imposing such regulation on them. And in addition to those three questions, I fantasize about doing the other round on this side. So. Shall I take the Turkish question? Uh, and I'll try to be brief. These are very vast, uh, complex uh, subjects. So I'll be sort of telegraphic, if I may. First, uh, we started off in 1957. In 1963, uh, Turkey became an associate country of the European communities at the time. 1963. Well, your parents were hardly thinking of having a son by that time. Uh, so, long time ago. Uh, so we have a long relationship with Turkey, uh, meaning that we think of Turkey as a partner since almost the very beginning of the European Union, and so does Turkey. So there has to be the two to, to understand the same way, and that's what we've been doing for uh, many decades. A few years ago, we thought that it was time, we thought, us and Turks, that it was time to move a step further and consider the possibility of Turkey joining. Uh, that made sense economically because we are by far Turkey's most important uh, economic partner. We have a customs union with them, meaning that we have an external border applying the same tariffs uh, as uh, Turkey does. Uh, our investment in Turkey is the most important from any other source, much more important than the American one. Uh, we have a flow of people between Turkey and the European Union, which of course justifies an upgrading of relations. All of this was behind, uh, and also strategic reasons, of course, uh, reasons uh, behind the, the decision to move to uh, an accession uh, mode. Uh, since then, we've been negotiating. It's difficult. We knew, and Turks knew, that it will take quite a long time. Uh, recently, some political problems have appeared, and uh, one should be very clear about that. Inside the European Union, some countries more than others, doubts were expressed about, is this the right thing to do? And some in Turkey also have questioned, does really Europe 
does Europe really want us to join and should we invest so much in this relationship? So the doubts are there, the political debate is there. No one uh, has uh, stopped the negotiations and the negotiations are ongoing. But it's a process that requires understanding on how to move forward. And today we must recognize that we are in a situation in which we need to look again uh, at where we are and see how we can ma make things move uh, further. We are developing today uh, uh, what we call a positive agenda with Turkey. We want, in spite of difficulties in the negotiations, still to continue to work very hard with Turkey to develop different areas of cooperation, including on foreign policy. Turkey has become a regional actor, and it's very important. So I cannot predict when they will join. Uh, it will take some time because the issues are important. Countries, uh, Turkey is a big country uh, in a very sensitive area of the world. Uh, so, uh, but I'm confident that we will continue to strengthen the relationship with Turkey. Turkey is also a member of NATO. Most of our countries are members of NATO. So there are strong links and they will remain, certainly. On Hungary, very briefly, uh, you know, the, 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 the union is uh, a union of law. Rule of law, respect for law. So whenever any member state of the European Union steps out of the territory that we consider being one of respect for EU law, the European Commission, which is the guardian of the treaty, and ultimately the European Court of Justice, if there are uh, issues to be brought to their attention, has to intervene. And this is what the European Commission did a few, week, a few days ago, I think last week, uh, on two or three areas of Turkish law that we thought were not under a, following the first appreciation by the European Commission, not fully in line with the EU law. And that we started, the European Commission started an infringement of the procedure. You know. And this process has rules and timings, and we asked Hungary a few questions about how, it should, how they would intend to proceed on these areas. Uh, more recently, the Prime Minister of Turkey was in Brussels. Hungary. Uh, Hungary, sorry. Uh, <laughs> in contact. Uh, so I'm optimistic about Turkey. You see, <laughs> really, uh, inside the Union. Prime Minister of Hungary was in Brussels. Discussions with the President of the Commission. Uh, I'm not aware of the details because you know, I've been traveling since. But uh, the dialogue is ongoing with Hungary to address uh, uh, these issues. On ETS, uh, ETS is a market... ETS stands for Emissions Trading System, which is a market-based mechanism to encourage uh, economies and corporations and companies to reduce uh, their greenhouse uh, gas uh, emissions. As part of our fight against climate change, in which we have set quantitative targets until uh, 2020 in the European Union. Uh, we are enlarging this uh, European trading uh, emissions trading system to a number of economic sectors, including now aviation, and there is a debate with the United States about that. Uh, we decided to go our, on our own, regardless of the existence of an international agreement on climate change, because we believe we have a responsibility. We, for the moment, are responsible for around 11 percent of world greenhouse gases emissions, but we still believe we have a responsibility because we have contributed to the present situation by being one of the most developed regions in the world, and we assume that responsibility, and we, have to, we want to be on the forefront of the fight against uh, climate change. Uh, so we understand that our companies may have some financial and economic burden by uh, being uh, constrained to apply these measures, but at the same time, apart from being our responsibility, we believe that our economic benefits to be gained from being, from being leaders in this process. You know, the first mover advantage. Because by fighting climate change, we are at the same time stimulating the emergence of new technologies, greener technologies, clean energy, and we, we hope that the world will move in the direction that would allow us to uh, benefit from the advantage that we have today by being the first movers in all these uh, areas. And you see many European companies being world leaders in uh, cleaner uh, forms of, of energy. So 
uh, we assume our responsibility, we, we took the leadership, we want to keep the leadership, but of course, like all leaders, uh, we like to lead, but we, we would like to see people behind us. <coughs> we don't want to be too far away from the next guys. That's why we are engaging with the United States and China and uh, all the other countries in the world, and we have been uh, very determined in international negotiations, we, because at the end of the day, what we live in the same planet, there's only one planet, uh, we share it, so we should all contribute to its uh, well-being. Can I just add a few words on, on ETS, not much. You, also, you asked about the corporations, and I think I mean, European airlines are going to comply, of course, with European legislation. And we need to maintain a, a situation where there's a, playing, a, le, a level playing field for European airlines and foreign airlines. And therefore, of course, it has to apply to every airline that goes to and from the European Union. And this is really, I think, people are making this issue much bigger than it actually yeah. is. Because we're talking one or two dollars per ticket uh, in this system applied by 2013. So I think everybody will be able to to survive, and this will actually be not so much the airlines, I suspect, but the, but the customers who have to pay at the end of the day. On Hungary, just one word more. I mean, when in times where of economic crisis, it, you will have in all parts, you have that in the US as well, more nationalistic uh, developments. I think the European Union is actually proving itself in the case of Hungary. Had Hungary not been part of the European Union, it would have gone astray. But because we have this system in place where we actually have checks and balances and keep people to their promises and also continue living up to the values, as, as Charles said, the Hungarian Prime Minister has been to Brussels and there has been discussions and I think there is a realization that, well, maybe he overstepped so he's going to change the different proposals in the law so that it complies with, with the European acquis. Uh, otherwise, there will be uh, proceedings going forward uh, that leads to uh, different sanctions. I don't think it's going to go that far, but it's just one another area where it really proves the value of the European Union that we have these, uh, this framework and, and, and a way to protect the values uh, going forward. On Turkey, we think in Denmark it's Turkey strategically belongs in the European Union, um, but, and for political reasons that has been become a little bit more cumbersome over the last couple of years, but I mean, this is one of the biggest markets close to Europe that we have, and there's a lot of economic growth in Turkey, so there's many reasons also, foreign policy reasons, why we want to drag Turkey closer to Europe and not push Turkey away from Europe, and I think that is also in the back mind of all our political leaders in, in Europe. I'm, I'd love to do one light. Great, we can do one more round of concise, to the point questions. Um, sir, in the glasses there. Uh, I'd like to commend Denmark for what it's doing in terms of green energy and the EU, EU in general for what it's trying to do in terms of climate change. I think in the past, the cap and trade system in Europe has all too often been sort of a shell game, and I, I hope that, that changes. Uh, my question is, you, you mentioned uh, that the EU is trying to engage the U.S. Uh, could you expand on what, what uh, is actually happening there? Uh, and and um, what advice would you give to Americans to try to change the U.S.'s present lack of any policy in terms of climate change? Um, Ma'am in the third row, or in the back in purple? Doesn't that kind of undermine European common voice? 
Is any last person on fire? <laughs> I will try uh, concise uh, responses. Europe is trying to engage the U.S. I mean, you can only have a global deal if you get the largest emitters uh, to be part of it. We tried that in Durban. Uh, I think we actually managed to push the, the, um, the process forward. We had the success of uh, putting pressure on the U.S. and China to sign up to the idea that we can actually have a legally binding instrument for all, not only those who are part of the Kyoto Protocol. The climate, as you know, in Washington is not for, uh, for uh, climate change. And if U.S. Nego negotiators had come back with a new treaty and said, Mr. President, please take this to, Sen to the Senate for them to ratify, he would have been laughed out, out of Washington. So therefore, we are working to, to create a situation where the U.S because you are one of the world's largest emitters, step up to your responsibility because, as, as Charles said, we are only emitting about 11% in Europe, so we can only lead by example, or we can't solve the problem ourselves. But now that you have a roadmap towards this, which is uh, something that the U.S. signed up to, to advise on what to do. I'm trying to change the, um, the way you address climate change in this country, uh, going around talking about the issue. But it's really a hard, hard, hard one to sell these days because it has become sort of hostage to the, um, to the political uh, situation you have in this country. It's absurd that you have a situation where in 2009 you had more people believe in climate change than you have now. And this is because uh, it is used as a political tool in, in the sort of the, the big fight of, of which ideological solution should be the right for the country. I think in the meantime, we need to go out and have states and local communities focus on the added advantage of going green and, and, and build not from top down from the federal level out to the states, but build from bottom up uh, in the meantime. And then, uh, I mean, the problem you face, and, and uh, people know that in Washington, they just don't want to admit they know it, is that the longer you push this in front of you, the more expensive it's going to be to solve it. And it will have to be solved at the end of the day because nobody will survive with six uh, degrees more in 2050. So therefore, if you wait 10 years, you'll just have to invest much more money, and that will have a negative impact on other areas of your prosperity in the U.S. We are doing what we can in Europe, so we will be home free uh, because we will already be in place 15 years down the road. But if you don't start doing your investments now, then you can talk about shale gas and everything. The fact is that the climate will fall apart if you don't do it, and you will have to do it, and it will be just be more costly down the road. Um, external action, so I have to say this because he's part of it. It's a great thing, and this is what we need. Uh, we have the right tools in place. We have to realize that we, when we call something action service the first day, people are looking, looking for action. But it will take some time before you can have action because you need to have somebody actually doing the action. And that is actually being built up very quickly now. You also have to realize that you have different, can we say, cultures that have been pushed together from the commission, from the council, and also from member states, and they have to learn to work together. But the fact that, um, that uh, Lady Ashton is criticized in, in, in the European Parliament is just a sign of democracy. My foreign minister goes to Parliament, and he is criticized for his foreign policy. This is only part of the game going forward. But I think the only way that we are going to play a global role is if we have one voice speaking for Europe. And those big member states, is really, this was the, sort of the problem we had earlier, that Sort of the regional powers in Europe wanted to have their own voice, but they also realize now that the only way the EU and Europe can have an impact on global issues is if we stand together and speak with one, one voice, and that's the guy sitting next to me and his guys. I, I skipped the transaction tax because I don't know enough about it to, be, to say anything 
but I don't know if you can say something. Thank you, thank you, Peter, and thank you for the nice words about the External Action Service. Uh, uh, a couple of remarks complementing what uh, Peter said. On climate change, uh, one angle, for, for instance, in which we are working with the U.S., we both agree that uh, any deal on climate change or any progress on fighting climate change implies a strong involvement, commitment, action by emerging economies. Uh, we know that we have different degrees of historic responsibilities. We contributed more, we, European and Americans, more to the present situation of the planet than the Chinese. Fair enough. So we agree that there has to be differentiated, uh, uh, let's say, contributions to the fight against climate change. But on the other hand, uh, it's not the guys who are responsible for 11% of emissions today that are going to solve the problem of climate change in the planet. We are a drop in the ocean if nobody else does anything about climate change. So we need to balance this situation. And as I said, we are in agreement with the US on the need for China, India, Brazil, the emerging economies to pay or contribute their fair share of the action that is required. So this is an area in which we cooperate positively with the United States. Uh, we are partners in the international negotiation. We try to find solutions for that. So uh, I think, and I'm always optimistic about the capacity of the transatlantic dialogue to produce results. Uh, as Peter said, there are a set of political conditions that are constraining uh, the debate here in the US. Uh, I hope that in the next uh, political cycle, in this country, we can uh, uh, go back to a, a very serious discussion on climate change and what we can respectively do to contribute to a solution. On, uh, on the financial tax, um, uh, the issue is being debated in Europe. There's no decision yet. There are proposals on the table. Discussion is taking place now. What is the rationale behind it? The, uh, who asked the question on the financial tax? Yeah. Um, sorry. The, the rationale for it is, is simple. European public opinion believes that banks were part, at least partially, part of the problem uh, with the financial crisis. Uh, they see, uh, they believe that banks should contribute to the solutions to this financial crisis. And they believe that in terms of uh, uh, contribution, uh, a financial transactions tax, which is a very small, will be a minimum amount of any transaction, uh, would make sense from a political point of view uh, to exist. The discussion is taking place. There's the issue of uh, whether or not to do it. The second issue is whether or not uh, all member states should be bound by it. And the third issue is to say, should only Europe be the only ones doing it or should we go for a global? Uh, financial transaction tax, the debate is, is complex, as you can understand. For the moment, inside the European Union, proposal on the table, discussion uh, taking place. Uh, very last word on, on Cathy Ashton and the External Action Service. Uh, I mean, if, if you want to exist politically, you have to be, to be criticized. I mean, that's part of the democratic uh, reality. So. I don't think Cathy Ashton is, is concerned or worried by, by criticism. Uh, she's uh, the, the, in a determined way fulfilling a role. And I mentioned the Iran sanctions package. Uh, uh, as I could mention, the Middle East peace process where he's, she is now, this week, traveling in the region. I could mention the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, for which she was, again, uh, very much instrumental. I could mention the Libya situation where the European Union played a role and it continues to play, or Tunisia where we are uh, uh, supporting uh, uh, transition and uh, the Arab Spring as a whole where the European Union has a fundamental role. And Cathy Ashton and the, the external action services uh, behind all these actions. So, uh, as you can expect from me, I'm, I'm more positive than you are about, about it. I believe that, uh, as Peter said, it's, uh, we started just a year ago, uh, but we already see the change and uh, I'm very happy to cooperate with my fellow uh, member states ambassadors in Washington in uh, co coordinating our action. Uh, we have a very good dialogue with the United States and the United States authorities have also understood uh, the relevance and the usefulness of having 
one person like Cathy Ashton that can speak on behalf of the Union covering so many areas and the relationship be between your Secretary of State Hillary Clinton and Cathy Ashton is excellent so um, I hope that when we meet next time uh, we will have even more reasons to be happy about uh, the results and the, the impact of the external action service and the cooperation with the United States. Thank you. And I certainly hope there will be a next time. Copies of the inspiring Danish strategy. We have a few at the front. We have a lot of copies of, if you liked this, come to more events at the back. But the best thing, of course, was the experts, the ambassadors who came to share their time and ideas. So can we thank them? Thank you.